to Locally Sourced, I'm Armando Famoletti. Taxes, the dues we pay to be part of this great country. But are they fair? Are they too high? Are they too low? Well, tonight my guest is going to answer those questions and more. Welcome, Stott Ring. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, those are some of those are big questions. Yeah, um, and you're going to answer those I, and I'll, more. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Scott. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. My pleasure. I've been wanting to have a tax show for a long time because it's so complicated, and now we have a new tax law. Nothing more exciting than taxes. <laughs> and what's going on? Well, when you pay lots of them, uh, it is does come to the top of your list of sure. things you want to know about. Um, so you're a tax expert. Tell me something about your background. So I'm a tax attorney. Um, I went to law school and I graduated in 2012. My father has a tax business and I grew up in the business. Um, and so after law school, I started working for him actually when I was in law school and uh, I went from there. So what we do is we do a lot of tax preparation, like what a CPA would do, but instead of having CPA certification, we do everything with our law degrees. Um, we do probably 2,500 tax returns a year and then we do tax and real estate law the rest of the year. and. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the, the crux of it is just doing it and, and learning mm -hmm. uh, as you do. And you have, uh, you and your dad have two offices, right? Yeah, we have a Mohegan Lake office in northern Westchester and then one in Midtown on 43rd and 5th. So um, your dad's at one and he's... So we mix. I mean, he's they're, they're, Gary the tax man. He's Gary the tax man. Yeah, Gary tax man. What did he do to get you to become a tax? I mean, were you just like, Daddy, when can I come and be a tax attorney with you? Or no. did he have to kind of maybe... So. Um, the, my first uh, show of interest or, or uh, re remarkable event was in nursery school. I was asked to name one of the seasons, and I said tax season. <laughs> As, and uh, so I never, I've, I've never been able to forget that. Um, but no, I just grew up with the business. And then I went to law school. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I worked at the New York County DA's office. I worked at Legal Aid in Brooklyn. I worked for the Port Authority. I worked for a judge. I just wasn't that, I, I didn't fall in love with criminal law like I thought I might. Um, that's the romantic one, right? right? That's you sure. see on TV, Law and Order, whatever. Um, there's not as much romance in there's real not. life, no. and so I, uh, I went with the family business. Great. Okay, and I guess you're pretty good at it, right? Because yeah. your dad didn't fire you. Yet, He's not so. fired. Well, now we're partners, so you know it'd, it'd be uh, he had to break up the family for it. But no, it's, <laughs> I, I like it. The underlying law is boring. Taxes are boring. They are, but it's people. I talk to people, I interview people like this to find out you know, how we can get the best result for them. And that I think I, I enjoy doing. Okay, so um, speaking of taxes, um, there's a new tax law, the, what, what's it called? The Jobs Act? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> tax Reform yes. Act? Jobs, okay. It's gonna be known as the 2018 tax law. That's what it's- That's what everyone some calls point, it well, now? That's, it, well, that's what it will be called. Okay, um, so, uh, this is going to be the first time, it went into effect in 2018, it's going to be the first time people sit down with their taxes and try to figure out how the new tax law is going to affect them, that's right? That's correct, yes. So that's going to be a bulk of what we're going to talk about, and I have a bunch of slides um, that show the changes uh, of the 2018 tax law from the previous tax Great. law, right? So we're going to bring up that um, the first slide now, and um, in a minute. <laughs> There it is. Okay, so federal tax law changes. Um, now, I I per uh, I got these from um, your website, which is very helpful, by the way. If people are interested in. I hope um, it's right. <laughs> I hope it's right too, because you know now my my name is behind right. it, Scott, and, and there you go. So, um, so tell us right from the start, um, and you might have to as we go through this explain some of the terms, because sure, no not problem. everyone knows what top marginal rate means. Right, that's, so, that's not a problem. So the top marginal rates are reduced um, at all income levels. So we have a, a marginal tax system, meaning that if you are told that your tax bracket is 25%, you don't pay 25% of all of your income. You just pay 25% of your last dollar. There are other brackets before then. So let's say everybody, this is the example I always give to clients as to why it's good to keep making more money. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to use... You have to convince people well, yeah, of that? Because people are afraid if they go into the next bracket, they're going to lose money. Okay. And so um, these are not real numbers, but just for what marginal means. Mm -hmm. Let's say that between zero and $100,000, you are in a 10% tax bracket. Okay. If you make exactly $100,000, you pay 10000 in taxes. Let's say everybody who makes $100,001 and more is in a 50% tax bracket. If you make $100,001, you pay 10,000 still on the first 100,000. You still pay a 10%. Mm -hmm. You only pay 50% on the next 
I dollar. See, okay. So lowering that marginal tax rate, uh, which, the, which the government did, lowers that 50% in this fake numbered example to 30%. Okay. So you're paying less on that next dollar. Okay. All right. So that could be a good thing. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, lowering the marginal rate is good for, for everybody um, now. Okay. Now. Okay. You know, a lot of the concerns with I know this taxes, is going to this is going to go away in a few years. Well, right? not just or that, it's but temporary. Yeah, but but those kind of things a lot of times they get carried over. Uh, I say now because these are good for people now. But if you have less, just governmentally, if you have less mm -hmm. revenue, um, and you don't cut your spending, then your debt, you know, explodes, and, and that's down right. the road. But right. but selfishly, everybody will probably everybody is starting off better, all else being equal, by lowering the marginal okay. rates. All right. So number two, uh, personal exemption amounts are reduced to zero from four thousand fifty dollars. That doesn't sound good. Is well, that good? If we we have to kind of combine two and three on the slides. Oh, let's talk about three. <laughs> the standard deduction nearly doubled. Ooh. The single individual and married individuals filing separately to $12,000 for heads of households to $18,000 and for married individuals to $24,000. Now, when you say married individuals, you're talking about a, uh, the tax return that a married couple submits. Each person doesn't get twenty. dollars Correct. That's for a married, a, joint, a married joint tax return. Okay. So the reason that they're relevant together, two and three, is previously... Um, for most taxpayers, because things do phase out at higher incomes, but for most taxpayers, each person on the return, adults and dependents, would get an exemption of $4,050. So if I was a single father and I had one kid, we would have $8,100 of exemptions. Right? It would go from that $4,050 each to zero now, so we have no exemptions. Mm -hmm. But by, by doubling the standard deduction, it makes up for a lot of the loss. The people that will miss out or, or the people that that will hurt in that particular situation mm -hmm. are those who have four kids, mm -hmm. three, four kids, five kids maybe. Um, although even even then with the higher married uh, joint standard deduction, um, it won't affect everybody. Now, you take the standard deduction if you don't have enough itemizations. A lot of people were itemizing and they may not now because uh, we'll get to more of that later. Right. But because the standard's higher, you'd have to surpass Mm -hmm. the standard deduction to deduct other things. So you'd probably have to look at last year's tax return and say, this is how much I was able to deduct, and then say, does that amount to $24,000? Well, and if it doesn't, then go with the standard deduction? Well, not necessarily, because the other there are other rules that changed also. So, for example, you... No, that was my simple answer, Scott. That, that's, <laughs> that's why we need tax attorneys, right, I yeah. guess. <laughs> I no. proved the point. Okay. So, so if you have the, one of the rules that changes, and I think it's on one of the other slides, um, you can no longer write off in excess of ten thousand dollars of state and local tax paid and real estate tax combined. So for a lot of people who live here who own property, they're paying more than ten thousand dollars in property tax alone. Uh -huh. So let's say you pay fifteen thousand in property tax, you can no longer deduct five thousand of that. And so if you looked at your tax return from last year, and you had ten thousand in mortgage interest and fifteen thousand in property tax. Your itemized deductions were twenty-five thousand. That's more than the new standard right, if you're married. Right. But because you can't write off that full fifteen thousand in property tax, your new itemized would be twenty. So standard is better, but you're still spending the money. You're just not getting all the benefit of it. Oh, for heaven's sakes! Okay, um, so let's go back to our slide. Sure. Um, the child tax credit increased to two thousand dollars per child. Well. That's there good. you go. Yeah, That's so, an offset, right, yeah, of so, I mean, it, using it, those exemptions. Yeah, and, and well, they're actually, a credit is much more valuable than an exemption. And I don't know how detailed we want to get into to tax law, but... Well, let me see, if, test my knowledge. Sure. An exemption, because I used to work, <laughs> and um, I used to fill out a form, and it said, how many exemptions do you want to take? And mm -hmm. I would, you know, put myself, and if I was had an independence. So um, I take it now when we fill out our tax forms... Um, that we're not asked that question anymore because we can't take those exemptions, but uh, uh, and that means that a certain amount of money is taken out of your pay before uh, it's reported to the tax man, right? And right. then a child a credit means that you get you, you have your taxes and you just say credit, and I get two thousand dollars off my taxes. Yeah, so that, that's pretty much right. 
Um, the, the first part where you fill out your form, that they still do fill out the form, and that was always just to tell your employer How what much you, to withhold. Right, what you wanted. You didn't have to be, it, you weren't under penalty of perjury for that. So, <laughs> okay. No, so some people, they want to owe a lot of money. They say that they have a lot of exemptions, even if they didn't, because they'd rather have less taken out of their taxes. Okay. Right. Less taken out of their paycheck. But uh, the biggest difference between an exemption and a credit is an exemption is reduced before tax is figured out. So if I made $100,000 and I had a $4,000 exemption, my taxable income is now 96000 okay? Let's say the tax on that is 10000 just for ease. Okay. Okay? But for a credit, that credit is then taken off your tax, which is a much bigger benefit. So instead of paying 10000 in taxes, now I'm only paying 8000 Yeah, that's good. That's credit much, is better. Credit Credits is better. Credits are good. And so they increased the credit from 1000 to 2000 Okay. Back to our slide. <laughs> um, State and, oh, here's what you were talking yeah, about. We, State and local deductions, the SALT, are capped at $10,000. Um, so you explain that a little bit. Um, oh, and also, but businesses don't have to worry about that. It's only the poor individual taxpayer who has to suffer with this new law. Yeah, right? so if you use your property for investment purposes, then you, uh, or, or if you have a property that's an investment property, you can still exceed the, the $10,000. But for Regular, you know, Mary and Joe who, mm -hmm. who own their house, if they pay more than 10000 in state and local income taxes and property taxes, they can only benefit from $10,000. Um, so what's included in that? Well, your property taxes, which is your school, town, county, mm -hmm. uh, and then just the, the state withholding that's taken out of your paycheck, that's a state tax. So that combined with your property tax is capped at 10000 Wow. Um, that will have a significant impact on people in Putnam and Westchester and other high property tax areas. Uh, because they're they're spending money and they're not getting any uh, or, or or they're losing a benefit of that money. Right. So we'll get to whose taxes are going to be higher soon. But it sounds to me that if you live in a a high tax state, that your taxes might be higher in 2018 than they were in 17, because what you could deduct in the past is actually more than the standard deduction, possibly. Right. So I mean, it's hard to it, you know. There's nothing black and white, but but yeah, that's I, why we have tax attorneys. Right. Uh, but but I think that there is a lot of, of risk uh, for people that that live here, working people, because other things that you can't deduct. And I'm not sure if there's any slides on this. Are itemized deductions, um, un, unreimbursed work expenses, are no longer deductible mm -hmm. on the federal level. So if you're a police officer, you used to be able to write off your uniform expenses, your your guns and ammo. Uh, that's no longer deductible. Um, and so, oh, wow. I didn't know policemen had to buy their own guns. Well, if they, if they do, you know, their training, it, it helps. It's ordinary, necessary for their for their line of work, and it was deductible. It's no longer an option on the federal level to deduct that. Oh, okay. So let's go back to our slide, and I think we do have something like that on there. Um, temporary uh, reduced threshold for medical expenses. Okay, so that sounds like it's a deduction. So are they? Are we? Uh, do we get to deduct more of our medical expenses? Or yeah, less? possibly. So when uh, medical expenses go towards your itemized deduction, if you itemize. The other threshold, the previous threshold was 10%. So if you made $100,000, you would need to have in excess of $10,000 in medical expenses to write off $1 of them. Now that's 7.5%. So that okay. it, it allows you... To, to more quickly write off your medical expenses, but you'd still need to add those to your other itemized deductions to see if you exceed the standard deduction. Okay, ay, 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 all right. Um, and the next slide, I think we're done with this one, thank you. Um, so, oh, I remember reading about this right before the new year. Mm -hmm. This was a big deal. Yes. Tell us about the alimony and, um, and how it, that changed in 2018. Sure, so uh, for a long time, maintenance or alimony, uh, was deductible to the person paying it, and it was income to the person receiving it. And so now it's no longer income to the person receiving it, and it's no longer deductible to the person that's paying it. Hmm. The original intent for that law, when it, when it used to, the, the previous law, was actually to benefit, uh, at that time, m many wives were not working. There's actually, there's a lot of okay. uh, old-fashioned things in the tax law, but, mm -hmm. but maintenance uh, in particular was... The reason that it became deductible for the person uh, that was paying it was to incentivize fair maintenance, okay. which is to say, hey, don't worry about paying your ex-wife X dollars because you're going to get to write it off on your taxes. You know, a lot of people, I think, uh, they look at it and they say, well, it's not fair to the person receiving it. They're ha they have to declare it as income. And that's true, but the purpose was to uh, encourage mm -hmm. wealthy 
husbands mm-hmm. to pay more. So tax law. That's not my some, opinion again. That's, no, that's part of the law. Right, yeah. but that's interesting because tax law isn't just straight tax law. You're saying that sometimes laws are made to, like you say, incentivize people to behave in one way as opposed yeah. to another. So there's this whole another layer of taxes that is kind of paternalistic in terms of trying to get people to do the right thing according to whoever thinks it's the right thing. Yeah, so we actually done. already hit on one of those other things. The child tax credit is to incentivize people to have more kids, right? The government, our government, most governments want their uh, citizens to uh, be fruitful and multiply and to, and to have more children. And so by giving a credit, it does incentivize people to, you know, I, I don't think most people are thinking of their taxes, maybe when they're having kids, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it does incentivize <laughs> it. So that's just another example of the government trying to, con- uh, I don't want to sound like crazy, control their behavior, but to oh, in- incentivize and, and encourage behavior. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to our screen. And miscellaneous itemized deductions are not allowed. And I think you mentioned something about business lunches. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, right. So um, that U- includes unreimbursed, uniforms. Right, unreimbursed business expenses um, if you're an employee. If you're a contractor, those things are still expenses against your um, freelance income or your independent contracting okay. income. Uh, what else is no longer allowed is uh, your tax prep fee. That used to be one of the miscellaneous itemized deductions. That's gone. A safety deposit box uh, fee, for whatever reason, used to be explicitly <laughs> on there. Um, those are gone. Uh, union dues, no longer deductible. So if you're in a union, if you're uh, in, in, in a local union or if you're in uh, – SAG or ASCAP, one of the, the entertainment yeah. unions, no longer deductible uh, your union dues against your employee income. Okay. So um, that's actually caused a lot of people to to stop. create entities. No, no, not just to stop, but like um, we have a lot of entertainment um, uh-huh. clients. And so if you are an actress and you're paying an agent and a manager 20% of your income, you have to change how you're going to be taxed uh, because otherwise you're spending 20%, you're not getting any benefit on your taxes. So those people created entities paying a higher tax rate to start with and paying a business tax rate, okay. but then they're able to still deduct those things. So that's caused a lot of people. The thing is, police officers, firemen, um, plumbers, electricians, people that pay union dues, they don't have the opportunity to form an S-Corp or an LLC and, and tell their, okay. tell the, hey, town of Carmel, as a sergeant of the police department, I want to be an LLC. Like, that's not going to be allowed. So it still does um, negatively impact those types huh. of unions. That's interesting. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, moving expenses. Oh, that's harsh. Moving expense deduction is suspended. Now, what does that mean, suspended? Suspended means that that's for now. So that's one of the things that's going to probably... Come uh, back later? Yeah, it might. But, but that's not also as bad as you think. So you could only have deducted your moving expenses if you moved for work and it was more than 50 miles. So if you moved from Maypac okay. to Putnam Valley, you were not going to be able to write that off. Even, anyway. if, even if it was for work. Okay. So that, that will influence less people than you may think because it's not anybody mm-hmm. who moves. It was already hard to get that in the first place. Okay. So at least the military benefit. Uh, yeah. That. So if you're moving for, for those purposes, then they still allow okay. that. We have another slide. We just have an endless amount yeah, of slides right. here. Slide, so. Keep sliding in. Uh, the last slide, the Affordable Care Act individual mandate was repealed. Good thing, bad thing? Uh, for taxes or for the country? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about the country in a minute. Yeah. So, for... I mean, for, for taxes, it's a good thing for, for people, for low-income people, uh, who don't qualify for Medicaid, who couldn't find a plan, uh, a health plan that was less than, let's say, $100 a month, which is a very cheap insurance yeah. plan. But that's $1,200 a year. And those people were paying much less than that in, in the individual mandate penalty or the tax. Mm-hmm. So for those people, if they continue to not have insurance, then their um, benefit is they will have less tax to pay. Mm-hmm. So that's good for them. Um, it's good Except for- Except that they don't have insurance. Right. Well, when I say the country, um, and, and, you know, single payer or, or nationalized health care, that's a whole different discussion. But just in general, if you have a healthier populace, you have a, a, a less expensive populace. Right? The, the healthier people are, sure. the less that the government has to spend on people. Mm-hmm. And so if people are insured, they tend to go to the doctor more. And then over time, it pays for itself. So maybe not good for the country because people aren't worried about this tax. Say, well, if I don't get it, who cares? Mm-hmm. Whereas before, it was if I don't get insurance, I'm going to have to pay tax for it. So uh, bad in that case. But I think uh, good year over year for healthy people that, that couldn't afford the plans okay. before. Okay, all righty. And we have a couple of uh, taxpayers can draw up to 10000 from a 529 education account. 
Um, and they couldn't do that before? What? Correct. So previously, you can only take money out of your 529. 529 is, is a college savings plan, or that's how it was deemed before. Now we're going to call it an education savings plan. Okay. But it used to be where you could take $10,000 out for your higher education, college and above, and that money had been growing tax-free, and you could take it out tax-free. Okay. Now you could also use that for a private school or for secondary education. Oh, that's the change. But the okay. one thing that is important to point out on that for people that do have kids in private school is New York did not change their law. And so previously, you put money into a 529, it only helped on your state, uh, or you got a deduction on, on the state level. There was nothing on the federal level, but it grew tax-free on the federal level. But now, if you put 10000 in, the maximum anyway, uh, to save money in your New York state taxes, and then you take 10000 out to pay for private school, you're going to have to pay tax on that 10000 on the state level because they okay. didn't change the law along with the federal. So that federally, you can take it out and not worry about tax. So if you live in Florida, Washington, North Dakota, one of these no uh, income tax states, great, but it make sure your state taxes, uh, New York did not change in that, in okay. that uh, regard. So um, where does the money for the 529 come from? Is that before or after taxes? Uh, so it's, it's after tax federally, and it's before tax Oh, for crying for out state. loud, okay. Right. Um, but it comes from your pocket. Okay. <laughs> it comes from us. And the alternative minimum tax is triggered at a higher income level. That's probably a good thing, right? Good. Yeah, so, I mean, to get into AMT, alternative minimum tax, would be its own seven-hour show. Okay. But um, basically, there, there was a time where even if you had a huge mortgage where you're paying a lot of interest and you had a lot of property tax, you would not be able to deduct everything, um, even though there was no official limit because AMT would kick in. Mm -hmm. That now is not triggered until a much higher level, and there's okay. different things that apply. So okay. that helps people who make um, more money than we've been talking about, but, but uh, it does help a lot of a uh, average people in this area. Okay, great. Um, so when we talked about the show, you said, you know, uh, you didn't think that the, the new tax law was really, when you add up all the pluses and minuses, I'm talking accountant talk here, yeah. <laughs> um, that it really is a good law. So tell me about why you don't think it's such a great law. I, I think it, it lacks foresight. So well, the deficit ballooned because of this, right? Right. Or that those are the projections. Yeah. And so I think that's my major issue with it. I think that, that most people, from my experience, two out of three, are going to do better under the new law than than the old law, each year, mm -hmm. or, or at least the first year. Right. Well, it, it does it go away in yes, 2025? There, right. There are some things that, that sunset, and, and we'll see. But it's hard for lawmakers to um, not renew those. Okay. Because uh, oh, because they could be popular. Right, um, but in the long run, we have the two major parties of, of, of our government like to spend now. Right, it used to be where one was the no spending and one was the big spender. Now they're both big spenders. Right, so we right it, Republicans used to be they used, they used to be, to be like party. deficits. We can't have deficits. Oh no! And now the Republicans, up until recently, ran every or every third of the how right. The, the president, the Congress, and right. the Senate, and and under them, the deficit ballooned. So, right. and so I don't get that. Yeah, I mean, that's it, it's hard to say. Um, <laughs> it's been ballooning since about 2008. It's been it's been increasing, uh, including the new Republic, you know, with, right, with Republican right. leadership. Um, that's you know, I can't explain national politics, but I know that when the bailouts. That's why you're here, Scott. Uh, uh, no, when, okay. you know, when 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 President Obama bailed out the auto industry, right, right. conservatives hit him on that, and I think rightfully so. From some, I am fiscally conservative on a lot of things. Uh -huh. I think that's right. You don't, gov uh, public money shouldn't be used for private business. Right. But then the, the government currently, they just bailed out private farmers uh, because of the tariffs. And so it's, it's the same, it, with the same amount of money about than, than the auto industry got. So if we have both parties of government spending our money on private businesses, among a million other things, right. um, that's why I think the tax law is bad, because we're having less revenue come in, and we're having our costs remain the same or go up. Uh, we keep borrowing money, and as interest rates rise, that money is worth more and more to the people that are lending it. It's, it's setting us up for uh, a disaster. So I heard <laughs> Not to be dramatic. No, don't be dramatic. I mean, look, you turn on the television, everything's a disaster, so yeah. we're becoming numb to it. But uh, So what I heard about why the, the new tax law was bad was because the rich were getting a big tax break, and the rest of us were only getting a kind of a little tax break. But you didn't say that, so no. is that true? Um, yeah, I think that the more money, uh, to to degree, in our so we did some projections last year, and the it depends what you call rich, right? Um, the biggest benefit 
dollar wise, not percentage, just dollar, was in like that four three fifty to four fifty five hundred thousand dollar range for a married couple. It's a lot of money, but it's not the one percent. I mean, of, of mm-hmm. the world. Our clients who made a mil, around a million were actually going to do worse under the new tax law. Oh, really? Um, but then, as you go up again, it, it becomes more beneficial. Um, there is benefits to the lower. So the super rich get a good deal. The medium rich don't. But the working well, class well, four hundred four fifty thousand dollars. The medium rich they they get a really good deal. Working class gets an okay deal. Okay. Um, Better than before. For 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 most people, it depends on how many kids you have. That credit's worth a lot of money. Oh. For example, so it, it, if you rent your if you rent your property, let's say you you rent your house or your apartment, and you have a couple kids, you're going to do better because you never you don't have to worry about the losing your your property taxes. You're going to get this credit now that you didn't have before. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not so cut and dry. I know you. That's oh you're man, here. you know Scott, we're running out of time, and I have so many other questions to <laughs> ask you. Like like you said that although the federal laws changed. The New York State tax laws changed or didn't, or no, not the same, right? So if if you used to itemize all your work expenses, like we talked about, still do that because you can still write them off possibly on the state. You just can't get any value on the federal. Um, okay, all right. So we can't talk about that. So I wanted <laughs> to talk about like one very quickly, one very local issue, and that is that one of the problems I think we have here is that our property taxes, our school taxes, are seventy five percent of our tax bill, and our tax bills is unusually high, um, highest in the, one of the highest in the country. Anything we can do about that? Uh, vote in better people uh, or vote people into office that are, are going to lower taxes is the answer. I, I don't think the way that it's Who framed, are those people? Well, <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to tell I you. I want but, names. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, pay attention to, to whatever's going on locally. But in terms of the framing of that, I, I don't know that the percentage doesn't matter, right? So we hear a lot locally in Putnam County that our county – uh, portion, our percentage is smaller than everywhere else. But that's not a relevant statistic because that just means that we have high other taxes. I want the lowest dollar amount. Mm-hmm. That's what I want. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, same with the school taxes. There's 75% of our bill. That's not super relevant. Mm-hmm. What's relevant is that they're so high, right. the actual dollar amount is so high. Yeah. Considering how many students we actually have in Putnam County, yeah. how many schools, how many supervisors. I'm getting a sign that we have to go, but I really <laughs> hope you come back. Sure. Um, because, Scott, you're just a wealth of information. I want to talk about your experience running for the Putnam County Legislator, what that was like. That must have been fun. It was. Sort of, kind of. Um, but I would anyways. rather have won, but yeah, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Except for that part, yeah. Mrs. Lincoln. How did you like the show? Um, so thanks so much for coming, and thanks to the crew who comes all the time and the guys in the control room, and um, see you next time. <laughs>